thanks so much for being here. Um, not gonna lie, I'm definitely nervous. Never spoken in front of this many people before, so bear with me. Um, hi, my name is Marina. Um, I am a portrait photographer, and today I'm here to talk about developing creative concepts for portrait photographers. So I'm gonna be sharing with you guys three things that helped me specifically level up my portraiture. Um, what you need to know to bring a creative twist to your already sort of traditional portrait sessions, and how to get started developing concepts but without any experience in art direction or styling. I think as portrait photographers, especially in the beginning of your career, a lot of the time you end up wearing a lot of hats um, and you become the photographer, but you also become the art director, the wardrobe stylist, the makeup artist, the casting director, the prop builder. There's so many roles that we play um, when coming up with creative concepts for portraits. And I kind of want to talk to you about like the three things specifically that I focus on in order to take my portraits like up a level to be more creative. Um, but first I'll start with my little introduction, a little bit about me. Um, I'm 27 years old. I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. I've lived in Salt Lake for about five years, originally from Florida. Um, I focus on creative portraiture and I have started dabbling in self-portraiture since the pandemic. Um, I would describe my work as colorful, funky, fun, full of movement. I mostly work with teams of women, which is like really fun and exciting. Um, yes. <laughs> um, and my business has pivoted over the past couple of years through the help of social media to really focus on in-person events. I host retreats and content days for photographers, as well as online education for photographers of, and content creators of all skill levels. So that's a little bit about what I do now. But I first wanted to kind of go back and talk about my introduction to photography, my story, and how my work has like changed over the years. Um, I was first introduced into, into photography when my grandpa gave me his old film, old film cameras um, back in middle school. He taught me how to load film on his 35 millimeter cameras, um, how to expose correctly, and that's kind of when I first started uh, getting interested in photography. After that, I got my first little point and shoot, and then when I was 16, I saved up and bought my first DSLR. Um, at that point, I was Really just, I had no idea how to use my camera, but I loved being creative. I would kind of get in the car with my friends. We'd pack a duffel bag of outfits and um, sort of just get creative. This was back in like 2011, 2012. We were very heavily influenced by Tumblr back in the day. <laughs> so all of our sort of concepts kind of came from that. Um, but it really was my first touch into like being creative and exploring that side of me. Um, and just taking photos for fun. And all I knew was that I loved creating and it's what I wanted to do forever. Um, after high school, I attended Florida State University, graduated, Ooh, go Knowles, wow. <laughs> and graduated in 2017. My major was studio art and my focus area was photography. So while I was a photo student in college, I started getting involved with these student-run fashion magazines on campus. Um, Basically, uh, students in different like creative industries would get together and put on a publication uh, each semester, and I volunteered my photography services for like women's and men's fashion editorials, beauty editorials. That was my first time working with a team um, to kind of bring a creative vision to life, and I got a little taste of that and was like, this is amazing, I want to keep doing this. Um, but I wasn't sure at the time how I could turn that into a career. Um, so at this time in college, I also started freelancing for the first time. Um, I was doing mostly portraits, but back then it was really um, sort of just graduation photos that was really popular at my school. So I was doing portraiture, but with a cap and gown. It wasn't as fun or creative, um, but I did enjoy it. And so that was sort of what I was working on in college. After college, I traveled for a bit, and then I eventually accepted an in-house photography position for a kid's clothing brand based in Utah, which was really exciting. I was able to kind of get a taste of the fashion industry, even though it was kid's fashion, but it was really fun. Um, and I started freelancing on the side, trying to build up a client base in Utah. Um, this was definitely a challenge at first. If you've ever, you know, picked up your stuff and moved across the country and had to start all over as a photographer, it's really challenging. So um, in order to help me do that, I attended a lot of um, meetups on the weekends, which I think were a little bit more popular pre-pandemic. But I was going to all these photography meetups, meeting these other creatives, these models, these makeup artists, and I started asking them if they'd be willing to collaborate to help build my portfolio. Um, so that's what I did a lot on the side. And after about a year of doing that nonstop every single weekend, I was able to leave my job to run my photo business full time. 
Um, at that point, I was pretty happy to kind of take any job that landed in my lap. So I was doing a lot of portraits, but I was also doing a lot of weddings and couples as well. Um, but at this point, I kind of, I didn't really have any creative direction for the portrait shoots that I offered with my clients or just like um, the shoots I was doing in general. Um, I, it still was kind of like similar to what I did in high school. There wasn't much planning behind it. But that's when I sort of started to educate myself and get a little bit more creative with my portraiture. Um, started offering like all-inclusive packages to my clients that included makeup, hair, uh, wardrobe styling, you know, props, stuff like that. So um, I was getting a little bit more creative on the side and started to niche down really on that type of photography specifically. I was also sharing this type of work the most on my social media. Um, I stopped kind of posting the stuff that I wasn't as passionate about. For me, that was like weddings and couples, sharing only the really creative shoots. Um, and eventually, that's what my business turned into. People wanted to book me for it because that's what I shared the most. So after that, COVID hit. Um, all of my shoots were canceled or rescheduled for much later. Um, but I'm sure you guys are photographers, you know, like I go a long time without shooting. I feel really antsy, like I want to create, but it was hard when I didn't have anyone to photograph as a portrait photographer. So I started dabbling in self-portraits for the first time, um, taking photos on my kitchen floor, my living room floor, um, using what I had around me in my house, props, lighting. I, before I got backdrops, I used bed sheets and just clipped them up to a backdrop stand and used only the natural light from the window in my kitchen. Um, so I started sharing that process on TikTok. This is when TikTok became really popular during the pandemic. Um, and that kind of opened the door to such a cool, huge, creative community of photographers online that wanted to learn more about photography, how to use their camera, how to plan a photo shoot, and the business and marketing side. So that is kind of what I started to focus on. So it's been a few years since then, but since then I've pivoted my business to focus on mainly just photography education. Um, I host in-person events now. I have a business called ColourPop Portfolio Weekend where we, <laughs> we have some past attendees here, which is fun, um, where my business partner and I um, put together 10 plus photo shoots in one weekend, um, really styled shoots with a huge team of models and makeup artists and stylists, and it's so fun. Um, so that is like a big part of my business now. Um, I have courses, guides, presets. I started a Patreon community where I post weekly videos on a topic related to photography or freelancing. Um, I still share tutorials and tips online, but kind of doing all this has been able to lead me to work with brands like American Eagle, Disney+, Plus, Samsung, Adobe, and Canon, which has been such an honor and so amazing. Um, but I kind of want to share with you guys, when I first took my photography business full time, how I turned my portraits from this to this. Um, and I just kind of want to talk about like these two sets of images. I would say, you know, when you first look at them initially, the main difference is the bottom images are way more colorful, obviously. My editing style has changed, of course. But, and there's nothing wrong with the images on the top row. Um, but I just kind of want to share with you guys my process behind um, you know, being more intentional, planning the shoots, uh, you know, getting more comfortable directing and posing your subjects uh, in order to create imagery that tells more of a story that is more creative and just is like full of movement. Um, I would say that when I first took my business full time and I was doing all these portrait sessions, I would a lot of the time let the location do the work for me. Um, I would repeat poses that I had in my back pocket. And you know that worked for me at the time and for my business, but it didn't allow me to like explore my creativity. Um, and ever since I've sort of become more intentional in all these things that I'm going to talk about today, um, the way that I approach like creating a photograph is much different, and it feels much more me. So I'm going to share with you um, the way that I achieve that by changing the way that I approach three things: drawing inspiration, being intentional, and post direction. So first, I would just want to talk about drawing inspiration. Um, I like to ask myself these questions when I'm ready to start planning a photo shoot, coming up with a concept. I think that as photographers, we all have you know, other photographers and artists in general that we look up to, that we're inspired by, whose work influences our own. And that's amazing. Um, I think that when it comes to coming up with like concepts and stories that you want to tell to, through your own photography, though, there's a couple things that you can like 
ask yourself and keep in the back of your mind in order to stay true to who you are and what your brand is as a photographer. So some of these questions that I like to ask myself is, how can you bring your own voice to the art that you create? What are you passionate about? Maybe that could be a movement, a culture, a hobby, um, a certain art style. Um, there's a lot of things that I like to kind of think about uh, and how I can make that um, resonate like in my work and the stories that I choose to tell through my photography. I also like to think about what art forms do I love to consume or partake in outside of photography and how can that bleed into the work I create. So I'm not a musician by any means, but I love music. I love playing the ukulele. I love singing sometimes at home. Um, and I love using you know, lyrics and melodies and visuals from musicians, like music videos and short films and stuff to like influence the ideas for my own photo shoots um, as just an example. And then finally, I like to ask myself, how would you describe your overall style and aesthetic? If you're able to kind of nail down your style with a couple of key words or even write an artist statement, and always keep this in the back of your mind when planning a photo shoot, you're able to kind of really stay true to who you are um, and create work that you know, amplifies that. So when it comes to drawing inspiration, there's sort of three different avenues that I often take to come up with ideas. Um, so the first is finding inspiration in other forms of art, which I talked about a little bit. But um, some examples of this could be paintings, illustrations, books, architecture, fashion. Um, I personally love fashion. I am not, I'm not educated in fashion at all. I admire it from afar. Like, but it definitely influences the work that I create. Um, and I just wanted to include a couple of examples of shoots that I've done specifically that were inspired by other form forms of art. So the first is a shoot that I did this summer at this pink lake in Utah that was the perfect location for this. Um, and this shoot was inspired by the famous painting The Birth of Venus by Botticelli. So uh, we built this giant shell out of wood and particle board. Um, we had our Venus in the center with long extensions flowing in the wind. Um, and we had like the goddesses on either side of her sort of reaching towards her and doing poses that like mimicked the style of that painting. But we did our own spin on it. You know, we did solo shots of each of them, had them pose in different ways that like didn't resonate with the painting. And it was just a great way to get creative with like an overall concept, but like put your own twist on it. That's more you. The second image is a shoot that I did that was supposed to mimic the look of historical, like Renaissance paintings of women in history. So um, we, and we also, the wardrobe styling was inspired by Gucci. So we did a lot of like pattern on pattern, texture on texture, lots of layers overlapping, um, and used these deep kind of colors and props like pomegranates and um, apples for her to hold. And we just wanted the image to look like a painting um, and sort of mimic that style. The image on the far right, uh, this wardrobe styling for that was inspired by the TV show Bridgerton. We were all really into that at the time. And we wanted to use huge hoop skirts and cage skirts and all of these fun sort of things that you nor normally wouldn't see um, in a portrait session. So that was really fun to get creative with. But these are just a couple of examples of like how I've used um, other forms of art and things that I consume in everyday life to inspire you know, the photos that I take. So next, I often find inspiration in everyday life. And I talked about this a little bit when I mentioned um, trying self-portraits. But I love kind of just looking around me and seeing what I have in my own home or just getting in the car and driving around, getting inspired by locations um, as just a couple of examples and letting that inspire uh, the idea for a photo shoot. Um, so I love getting inspired by nature, colors, textures, smells, objects just all different kinds of things that are present in what I consume and what I do. Um, and then just a couple of examples of that in this work is the first image. Um, I got the idea for that concept just by walking around Target and I saw hula hoops in the toy section. I was like, why have I never thought to use these in a photo shoot? They're such fun shapes and you can create such movement with them. Um, so I bought a bunch of them. We did lots of layering with them, like layering the hoops and like having her reach through them and doing you know, poses like this where we were spinning them as well. It was so fun and it was such a like creative, simple way to like bring another element to an image to like give it that visual interest. Um, the second image, uh, the sort of inspiration that came for that was I took a uh, picture off my wall and just popped the glass out of it from like a frame 
and then just took a water sprayer, like a water bottle and sprayed water on it and just used like a green LED and I wanted it to feel really mysterious and almost like creepy and scary. So it was like a cool way to just, you know, this image would have been fine on its own, but adding the level of like, adding the glass and the water and just creating that like depth, uh, just add a little bit more interest to it. And then finally, the last image was inspired by um, I was at Home Depot and just buying stuff for my house and I found this like painter's drop cloth for like two dollars that was so much material and I was like I know I can use this as a backdrop and create fun motion with it so we bought the uh, drop cloth and just clipped it up to my backdrop stand from behind used only natural light and kind of just held it from the sides and in front of my camera like billowing it up and down so that it created that fun movement we did video as well so just really simple sort of materials that i've used to level up my portraits in general so the last sort of avenue that i like to take when it comes to drawing inspiration is storytelling i think storytelling through photography is a really powerful way to make your images feel um, just like really moving and you know everyone loves like a beautiful photo but when it can tell a story it's so much more powerful and interesting to look at um, i love getting inspired by my own life my own stories and friends and people that i know their success their failure heartbreak loss as some examples um, this shoot in particular was with a friend of mine right after she went through a really bad breakup and she wanted to kind of like document that through photography. Um, she's a really creative person. This was like her idea initially. And I was like, I would love to help like art direct this. So, um, you know, I chose the location. I brought in props and um, we just played sad Taylor Swift songs the whole time. <laughs> she cried a little bit, like she told me what she was going through. Um, but it was like such a moving thing for her to be able to like kind of turn that into art. Um, which I loved and you know it was healing for her it was amazing um, it was a good experience but also the images are so much more moving when you like know the story behind it as well okay so next I want to talk about just being intentional in general when you're planning a photo shoot concept but specifically with color styling props and composition So I've included a couple of like basic photography principles or principles of art and design that I like to keep in mind when I'm um, planning a concept and planning all of the elements that go into it. Um, and I mentioned this before, but when I first started, uh, you know, taking my business full time and doing portraits full time, I was not very intentional. You know, I, I've always been a creative person, but I always, I never really played a role in, um, you know, like helping my client or subject or whoever it is, you know, choose the wardrobe. Let's think about specifically, you know, what you can wear to help tell the story, what type of lighting to use, um, what color backdrop, hair, makeup, um, all of these things are different elements that like you can play a role in as the photographer to really level up your image in general. So first is color. And color is huge. I love color. Um, I used to be afraid of color, as you probably saw. All of my images were like very neutral, lots of black and white. Um, I don't know why I was so afraid of color for so long, but uh, once I like leaned into it, it totally changed the game for me. Um, now I embrace color. I love using it in my photography. It's been really cool to see all of the setups here um, at the uh, conference downstairs. There's so much color going on. I'm excited to shoot. Um, and it's because color can enhance the composition, it can set a mood, it can tell a story and create emphasis in your imagery. So I think that, you know, as an example, like warmer colors can evoke a feeling of like joy and happiness and even like romance, whereas cooler colors feel more dark and mysterious. And that could be, you know, the, the colors that are present in the image that you're composing, um, all of the elements in that image, or it could also have to do with the way that you edit as well. Um, so color is huge and you can make intentional color choices when planning your wardrobe, makeup, backdrop, location, and editing. So I just wanted to include a couple of images that I styled um, around like a specific color palette. Um, the middle one specifically, complementary blue and orange are complementary colors. And I know that they stand out really well. There's some great contrasts. Um, the colors pop really well against each other. So the middle image is really simple. It's just two strobe lights. Um, from either side on my subject, uh, a plain blue backdrop, and I styled an orange headband and an orange top, blue earrings, but it just feels so much more like scroll stopping and interesting because of that color combination. So just being really intentional with the colors that you choose um, in your images is super important to have them, you know, be a little bit more scroll stopping and interesting. 
So second, I want to talk about styling. Um, I mentioned this, but I am not a stylist. I don't know really anything about fashion. But you know, through my years of kind of getting more creative with my portraits, I've been able to kind of learn what works for me and like what styling choices that you can make in order to um, like have the wardrobe and even props be like a big part of the story you're telling. So I specifically like to start with the emphasis of my image and then style everything else around it. The emphasis of your image is whatever is the main focal point. Um, that could be your subject. It could be the landscape. It could be the wardrobe. It could be a prop. Um, it could be the lighting. There's a lot of different things that can be the emphasis, but it's important to focus on that one thing and all of the choices that you make around you know, planning the rest of that photo shoot um, or of that image in particular, you wanna make sure that those things complement it versus detract. Um, you wanna make sure that all of those choices that you make allow that emphasis to shine through. You, I think it's important to ask yourself, you know, will adding this element, this hairstyle or makeup style, for example, or a prop or a backdrop, will it help tell the story or will it distract from what my emphasis is? So in general, I like to keep a kind of less, less is more mindset um, just because it makes images feel a little bit more profound when the eye can immediately know what is the emphasis of the image. Um, and I included just a couple of examples of shots that I've styled that, uh, and like what the emphasis of that image was and how I styled it. So um, the first image, the emphasis of that was definitely the location. Um, the salt flats in Utah are absolutely gorgeous. They're such a stunning location. And I didn't want, you know, the props and the makeup and the hair to kind of uh, distract from that sort of stunning background that makes the images look really interesting. Um, for the second image, the wardrobe was definitely the emphasis. I styled that shoot just around the top and bottom, the matching set. It was like this really cool textured, like quilted material that um, had this fun pattern. And it was busy already, so I knew that everything else I wanted to add to it should be simple. So we did really simple hair and makeup. I just added a little straw hat. We shot on a backdrop. It had a little bit of texture, which was fun, but um, kept everything else pretty simple so that that wardrobe would stand out really well against it. And then finally, this last image, um, the makeup was definitely the emphasis for this. We, wa we did a shoot that was inspired by, the makeup was inspired by like exotic plants, like tropical plants. So we had some crazy makeup going on, all this yellow and orange across her forehead and her face. And because that was like the main focus, we just added like um, some faux flowers for her to pose with and some gold earrings and kept the images really tight and close up around her face so that the makeup would really shine through. So next, I want to talk about being more intentional with props. When I sort of started incorporating props in my imagery, um, it took like a traditional, you know, like normal portrait. And it became something so much different and more interesting. I think that you can use props to bring a creative twist to your portraits um, in such an easy way. And it doesn't have to be expensive. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, hard to do. And I have some examples of props I've used in the past um, on the next slide. but. When I'm choosing a prop for a photo shoot, I like to focus on the texture, the shape, and the material of that prop. I like to ask myself, how will this photograph, how will it reflect light? Um, will the texture of it you know, help tell my story? Can I hold it up to my camera lens and shoot through it? What will that look like if it's like, you know, coming in from the sides? Um, so keeping these sort of like things in mind when choosing props will help you sort of determine you know, what material is best for you to use or what prop can help tell your story. Um, so I included this image as an example because I did a photo shoot that uh, sort of the story we were trying to tell was she threw a birthday party and no one showed up and she was sad. <laughs> so we had a lot of props for this shoot. Um, here, we, in this image particularly, we just have a birthday cake that says, I'll cry if I want to on it, and a bunch of balloons. But we also had an old rotary telephone. We had um, that she kind of like pretended like she was sad and calling her friends on. We had confetti, we had um, like a big velvet couch. We had all of these things going on in this set. But I think it's, this is a good example of like not going too far when it comes to props. It's good that for this shot, we didn't have the phone and the couch and the confetti. Adding all of these things in at once becomes chaotic. It makes your image feel really busy. Remember, less is more. So I think having like two props at one time, of course, it depends on your story and like what you're trying to tell. But um, for this, the cake and the balloons was enough to kind of create an 
an image that I felt was strong, and I love this monochromatic kind of pink on pink going on as well. So that's just an example of sort of keeping it simple when it comes to props. So these are images that I've taken over the past couple years with different random props that I've either just had around the house or I bought um, really affordable, a lot of them most of the time from the craft store. Um, string, glass, plastic, fabric, paper, cellophane. Cellophane's really fun because you can hold it um, in front of your lens to create these like rainbow sort of hazy light leaks or like wrap it around your subject. Um, curtains as well, I love using instead of like paper rolls because it just adds more texture and it's like really interesting, especially to have your subject sort of like peeking out from behind it too. It just gives you more versatility in your imagery. Um, and then assorted craft supplies. These are pom-poms that I had that I was gonna turn into garlands that I was like, wait, I should take photos with these first. Um, as well as, you know, butterflies and buttons and crystals and fake flowers. Like there's so many times that I just go to Michael's or Joann's and just walk around the craft store like looking for inspiration and it's so simple how like one really small thing can inspire an entire concept. So last, um, just sort of being more intentional with my composition in general um, has totally changed the way that I approach like a photo shoot and like directing my models. Um, I love to create interesting composition in my portraits by introducing variety. And by variety, I mean making Im each image feel very strong on its own, like it can stand alone as a strong image, but also work cohesively as a series with the rest of the images from your shoot. Um, so in order to do that at my shoots, I like to try a variety of different things. Different angles, shooting from up above or down low, um, different distances, that also means different focal lengths. So like farther away, closer up, um, different crops, I'm continually surprised by like how many times I take an image that you know looks fine, it looks great, but when I crop in a certain way or rotate a certain way, it feels so different and can tell a totally different story. So really keeping in mind cropping your images intentionally. Um, framing also, this uh, image here is an example of that. This is from a shoot I did where we had these set pieces cut out from like particle board and painted them to kind of look like um, like underwater barnacle type things. Um, we wanted to feel very kind of like alien-esque, but whimsical. Um, so we, we were using, having her pose with those, but at one point I just took one and held it closer to my camera, had my subject lean up against the wall so I could frame her body perfectly in that little wavy line, which was really fun. Um, and then finally, the way that your subject poses can totally change the composition of your imagery too, which I'll talk about more in depth next. Um, but I just wanted to include a couple of examples of, you know, what made the composition interesting in these photos specifically. The first one I would say is framing. Um, the emphasis of that image would be my female model. Um, and I kind of put her in the back and had my male model stand forward and make this fun like triangle shape with his legs to frame her in the middle. Um, the middle image would be the angle is what made that interesting. You know, I used a really wide angle lens for that so I could have some distortion with her hands and feet towards the camera. We shot through like a glass, a uh, plexiglass platform, which was really fun. Um, you know, that image is so simple. It's just the sky behind her. There's nothing else about it, but that angle and that focal length um, made the image feel really interesting. Um, and then finally, the pose of this last one is what made that composition interesting. Uh, we had like five dancers and we had them do all of these different types of patterns and groupings to create composition that sort of like mimicked each other and this like waterfall effect of that post specifically was really fun. So the last sort of concept that I really focus on in order to level up my portraiture was post direction. Um, and I wanna talk specifically about building trust with your subject, learning how to direct versus pose your subject and getting more creative. So building trust is like the biggest step, in my opinion, to posing or directing your subject. And it's one that's often skipped by beginner photographers. Um, I think that building trust is so important because when you're able to kind of break down these barriers of nervousness and, you know, potential like judgment, like you're, you're able to let your subject know that they're safe in your space, that you're never gonna judge them for anything that they do, um, that you like listen to them and give them feedback and they're gonna be more willing to try more creative things at your shoot. Um, so I always like to make it uh, a point of mine to, you know, if I'm shooting with someone for the first time and I'm able to, I like to meet up with them for coffee first or I like to talk to them for 10 minutes before I take out my camera 
because regardless of your experience as a model or subject, it doesn't matter if you've been modeling for years um, or you've never stepped in front of a camera before, meeting up with a photographer and doing a photo shoot always comes with nerves. Like it's always still a little bit intimidating. So it's our job as photographers to kind of get to know our subjects, make sure that they know that you support them and that you're here to get creative with them. Um, and then that will just lead to a better photo shoot in general. I think some ways that you can do this is positive reinforcement, always letting them know that they're doing a good job. I sort of have same things I say all the time. Yes, amazing, like you're doing so good. I sound like a broken record at a shoot, but it really does like help my subject feel so much better and more confident um, while they're posing. I think validating their feelings is really important too. And this is something I maybe didn't do when I was first starting. You know, if a model or a subject ever comes up and says, oh, I'm really nervous, or I have this particular insecurity, um, I think it's important to not brush it off by being like, oh my gosh, you don't have to worry about that. Like, you're gonna do amazing, let's get going. I learned that doing that is not the best approach. It's important to let them know that they're heard, that you're listening to their insecurity, that you know, you're taking that into thought when you're you know, working with them throughout the entire shoot so that they know that you know, their best interest is at heart with you. So that just helps create a safe space in general. Giving feedback is also really important. Um, I think letting them know when something is working is a great idea, but when something's not working, staying positive and saying, hey, okay, I love that, let's try it again, but this time, do this instead, or maybe let's just move on. Um, I think that showing images to your subject on your camera or tethering whatever it is um, is a good idea. I don't think it's important to do it constantly throughout the shoot, but every now and then when you know that you have an image that you're really proud of, that turned out amazing, letting them see it is a huge part of like building that confidence on set. And finally, learning how to not sort of micromanage your subject while they're posing is really important. You know, As photographers, it is our job to lead the way when it comes to direction. Uh, we should not ever be silent shooters just snapping away and not giving any feedback or telling them what to do. So it is our job to come with the overall direction, but just remember that it's like a push and pull relationship and you want your subject to be able to you know, offer up ideas while you're shooting and not shut them down by micromanaging too much. So next um, is learning to direct instead of just specifically posing. I personally found that, you know, when I stopped sort of breaking out the same exact pose as my subject every single portrait shoot and sort of uh, turned it into a little bit more of general direction, giving them an action to do or a movement to do, my images changed drastically. And you can like see that in my work and how, how most of my images are oftentimes like in motion. And that's what I love doing specifically uh, to make a strong image. And I think uh, by demonstrating, you can also do that. Um, this is like an a photo example of me giving direction at a shoot. Um, and you know, you can give post direction, but make it feel more you know, in motion. Like for example, this pose I was telling her to do was I wanted her to like, on the count of three, lean back as far as she could go and then stand back up. And I just kept snapping the whole time because those in between moments, the candid ones are the ones that oftentimes feel really real and genuine uh, versus the exact sort of explicit pose that you give them. Um, again, working as a team is huge, making sure that they know that they're safe and welcome to uh, you know, bring ideas to the table because a lot of the time you as a photographer can come with something in mind that you want to execute um, and you're able to do that, but you, know, you would never know how many like, amazing photos you could get if you like, shut down your subject. So making sure that they can get creative as well at your shoot and offer up ideas, you'd be surprised how many um, you know, images that you didn't expect to get that you're able to get because your subject was able to get creative with you. Um, the next point is sort of something I had to learn through time, but moving on when something isn't working is really important. Um, I think a lot of the time, I'm, as you can probably tell, I love being more intentional with every aspect of my photo shoot. So a lot of the time I come with like specific ideas of a shot that I wanna get or a composition I wanna try or some sort of movement or something in general. But then when I actually go to execute it, it doesn't turn out exactly how I expected it to. Um, and that's not really anyone's fault. It could be a combination of like many variables that lead to that. But learning to not force something that's not working is huge when it comes to creating an experience with your subject that's really meaningful and like positive in general. And also just moving on to try something else because again, you'd be surprised how sometimes the shots you don't plan turn out to be your favorite. 
And then in general, when it comes to direction, just keeping the overall photo shoot concept in mind is really important. Um, I think sometimes, you know, when we plan a shoot, maybe we have a mood board or an idea we've communicated to anyone that's involved in it. And then on set, maybe you get a little bit distracted by the lighting or something else. Um, it's important to kind of remember, what is the story that I want to tell with these images? Um, like, what kind of overall vibe do I want these images to give off? And make sure to give direction and poses around that concept. So, you know, sometimes I want my images, depending on the concept, to feel really feminine. So the poses that I direct, you know, are based around that. And um, I sort of, you know, give them direction around, like, uh, a lot of, like, fluid movements. And it just feels more feminine and ethereal in general. Whereas sometimes when I want something to be a little bit more edgy, I try some sort of, like, bold, emotional poses that feel a little bit more... Um, sort of like sporty even, um, that are a little bit more exaggerated uh, as just like an example of keeping the overall vibe and concept in your mind when it comes to the directions that you give your subject. So lastly, I just want to give a couple of tips on how to get more creative with your poses of uh, thinking a little bit outside the box of your traditional, you know, portrait poses. Um, the biggest one for me is having my subject interact with something. And a lot of the time that could mean the wardrobe, the props, the location, or the environment. When it comes to wardrobe, I love using fabrics and materials that I know can create really dramatic movements. So a lot of the time that means like a skirt or a dress or something that has a lot of fabric that can be like thrown or twirled or you know brought up even towards the camera. Um, or like if it's like a puffy jacket, having them kind of wrap it around them, get some close-up shots with that material and texture around their face. Um, and then also, Props, uh, interacting with props. Um, again, that example of the, the birthday party shoot, we had like the um, old rotary telephone, we had the telephone cord kind of wrapped around her arms and like brought it towards the camera to create this fun like spiral effect through the lens. Um, getting creative and interacting with the location around you is huge also. So especially if I'm shooting outdoors, you know, when I arrive to a location, I've probably chosen it for a specific reason, but it's also good to kind of just scan your environment and be like, what is around me that I can have my subject interact with to create a pose or a composition that's more intricate and more exciting than just a traditional sort of pose. Um, I also encourage my subjects to accentuate their movements a lot. And that, this is where the building the trust comes in, because sometimes you, you know, ask them to do a pose that feels weird or feels crazy or feels like something they would never do in real life. But that's where you have to kind of you know, promise them to trust you, because you know it'll look great on camera or for the story you're trying to tell. So um, you know, sometimes I'll have a subject um, you know, walk past the camera, and I say, I'd love for you to kind of strut past the camera like you're on a runway and just feel like own like you're on a runway. But then you realize that it looks so much better if the steps that they take while walking are like huge and accentuated and you would never walk like that but um, sort of like getting all those in-between shots and having them accentuate the movements that you suggest as dramatic as possible as weird as it feels like always turns out the most interesting in, in my case. Learning to switch up your angle when it comes to directing your subjects is huge also. Um, uh, this photo I shot from underneath on this plexi table, but I also carry a step ladder to every single shoot that I ever do, <laughs> whether it's in studio or outdoors. If I can have a real ladder, that's even better, but I'll bring it with me and I'll stand up on it and shoot down at my subject um, with even like a wide angle lens to create like a fun effect or have my subject stand up on the ladder and I'll get down low. So it just allows a little bit more creativity at your shoot to you know, bring sort of props and stuff like that with you. Um, getting creative with the emotions that your subject expresses is huge. So sometimes um, I'll have my subjects act really surprised or think about something that makes them sad or um, excited or just feel really fierce. You know, the birthday party shoot, we said, I want you to feel, you know, think about how it would feel like if no one showed up to your birthday party. You're sad, you're pouty, you're maybe a little angry, and all of those facial expressions become sort of like a character that your subject is portraying. And that's what gets like kind of the best images that really make you feel something when you look at them. And finally, I love to just use um, my subject's hands and limbs to create interesting framing and compositions. Um, you know, reaching towards the camera. You saw the example of him standing with his legs open with her kind of like posing from in between. So using these kind of things to enhance the composition and the angle of what you're doing um, to get a little bit more creative is very important. So I just included a couple of examples of what made these poses interesting. 
um, I would say the first one is the prop. You know, this positioning with her arms was done with the hula hoop in mind. Um, the second one would be the wardrobe. She had these really cool fringe arms that I had her keep throwing up in the air, up and down like a bird, that's what I told her. And the fringe just looks so cool being thrown out like that in motion. Um, the third one being the location. I we were just walking around this building and I found this like fence uh, that matched her blazer perfectly and I just had her kind of stick her arms through it and interact with it to uh, sort of create an interesting pose. And then finally, um, the angle. So that was when I stood up on a ladder and shot down with a wide angle lens and had her kind of mimic this sort of like elongated stretch that uh, matched kind of the ribbons behind her, which was fun. So sort of in summary, um, I just, I hope you guys found this helpful on bringing a little bit more creativity to your portraits, remembering to draw inspiration from other art forms, from the world around you and people's stories being intentional with colors, styling, props, and composition, and experimenting with poses by directing, demonstrating, switching up your angle, interacting with your environment, and most importantly, building trust with your subject. Thank you guys so much for listening. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Love talking to you guys. He asked which photographers have inspired me. I would say my favorite photographers are Jimmy Marble and Diane Villadson. Their work is also very colorful. I'm not familiar with the artists that you mentioned, but I'd love to see their work because, yeah, their work is full of lots of fun, contrasting colors, a lot of minimalism when it comes to the composition, keeping things really simple, but adding in pops of color as like the main visual interest. So they're probably my favorite photographers, and they definitely inspire the work that I do. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, when you're working in more collaborative settings where there's not an already existing budget, do you have any recommendations on how to decide to use maybe like a more DIY thing to do and, and the prop pieces that are a little more expensive? Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. There's like so many shoots that I do, especially with self-portraits. Those are like a huge DIY for me. I don't have a makeup artist or a hairstylist or an art director. Um, so when it comes to that, I've loved, you know, collaborating with other creatives in my community as a number one. Um, I love kind of talking about this because it's such a great way to like build portfolios, um, uh, not just yours, but the people that you're collaborating with. Um, and so I love working with local creatives and, you know, delivering them a gallery of photos in exchange for their time and work uh, by working with me. Um, I also love reaching out to local businesses, mostly clothing boutiques for me specifically, um, sending them a, uh, you know, a link to my portfolio of my work and say, hey, I would love to you know, borrow some of your pieces to style my photo shoots. Um, and in exchange, I can offer you this, whether it's uh, you know, images or tags on social media or whatever it is that you specifically feel is right for you. Um, yeah, I love working with local artists and creators. I work with jewelry brands a lot locally um, to kind of, you know, uh, lend a prop or a wardrobe piece, or I love working with backdrop, com drop, backdrop companies as well um, to sort of create content for them in exchange for, you know, whether it's their time or service or prop or something like that. Uh, she asked um, sort of how you can, you know, divvy up responsibilities and when you know to draw the line between saying like, you know, I'm willing to do this or I'm not willing to do this as a photographer. Um, and that's something that, you know, is a personal choice for you. It's personal based on like a by project basis, I would say. And if you are working for a brand, it's a lot of the time up to them. Um, but when it comes to like playing a role in the other sort of choices around like hair or makeup or model casting, for example, um, in the past, I've loved to kind of create packages that, you know, include my time and uh, effort and like energy into, you know, wearing those hats that aren't necessarily my own to fill because I love creative direction. I love playing a role in that. Um, and so I'm happy to kind of help make choices and create mood boards for brands or whoever I'm working with to, you know, make those choices in order to make the best photos possible. Um, but there have been times where, you know, I've worked with a client or something where they want me to like cast all of the models and do all that communication. And usually for me specifically, that's when I draw the line sometimes because uh, it's just, it goes into territory that's not necessarily my responsibility or that I'm not comfortable with. So um, when it comes to the events that I host, uh, ColourPop with my business partner. Um, she's the art director, I'm a creative director, and we, we sort of collaborate. Um, I work on sort of the uh, 
the conceptualizing of the ideas and the stories that we want to tell at the photo shoots. And she's more like hands-on prop making, painting, building sets, you know, and then we work with other uh, local people to like be makeup artists and stylists and whatnot as well. So it's sort of just, it depends, I guess, on the project is what I'm saying. But my general advice would be if you feel like you're being taken advantage of, uh, being asked to wear a lot of hats that you're not comfortable wearing, it's totally in your realm of like, uh, it's totally okay to like kind of put your foot down and be like, I don't do that, but I'm happy to consult or here's an hourly sort of rate for my consultation on that, if that makes sense. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, she asked why I choose the R5 over anything else. I have been wanting to switch to mirrorless for a while. In my opinion, it's just the future of where photography is headed. Um, before I moved to a Canon R5, I was on a Canon 5D Mark IV, which is a DSLR. Before that, I was on a Mark III. So I've been using the Mark III, Mark IV system for quite a while. Um, and I have just been itching to upgrade for a while. And I know a lot of people like have questions around like what's the transition like going from a DSLR to a mirrorless. Um, in my experience, it's been amazing. I've had to make some adjustments when it comes to my workflow with like the way I edit because the colors do read quite differently, um, but not to the point where it's like making my workflow a hassle personally. I think that the like eye detection and autofocus and sharpness, the quality of the R5 like outweighs any possible negative at all. Um, so yeah, I love it. I'm excited about it. <laughs> She asked sort of like what was my mindset in between transitioning from sort of traditional shoots that weren't as creative to like uh, the more creative shoots that I offer now. Um, I would say I just knew that like when I was able to work with a client or a subject that trusted me completely to, you know, play a role in like suggesting what wardrobe they wear or like, you know, the overall vibe and concept of the shoot. That's when I felt like so excited and honored to like have a client that trusts me to do that. And it really drove me to be like, I can continue doing this because there are people out there that like see my vision and they trust it. Um, and I think that what kind of helped with that is like when it came to like marketing was, um, you know, at that point I was still sort of offering the traditional portrait session where you choose a location, you show up and you shoot. But then I also on my website offered um, a sort of more creative session that included a choice of backdrop colors, um, an optional makeup artist, you know, props. Um, I had like a client closet of some wardrobe pieces as well. So like having that option available to the people who are interested in getting more creative is really awesome when you're sort of like in the limbo of in between doing that because you have like the safer option, you have a more kind of experimental option as well for people to like choose between basically. And throughout time I was able to kind of pivot really more towards that creative side, but that was like kind of what I did in between that kind of gave me peace of mind when it came to like paying my bills, but also, you know, gave that option to people that wanted to get more creative. Mm -hmm. struggle. Yeah, <laughs> it is a huge struggle. And, you know, I think that what changed the game for me a lot was like, really sitting down and looking at the big picture and being like, you know, what is it exactly that I do on a day to day basis that, you know, has the most payoff? Is it planning these, you know, content weekends and events that I'm hosting? Is it, you know, editing photos with clients? Is it creating videos for social media? Like whatever it is that you see the most payoff and focusing on that is really important. Um, I'm definitely someone that struggles to like delegate, delegate responsibility. <laughs> I like need an assistant really bad, but I'm like, I don't have time to find one. <laughs> but like, and I'm also just like, I don't know if I trust someone, like I'm a control freak, like I wanna do it the way I wanna do it. But I think that like, when you're, um, when you make time to, you know, set aside, like, I know this is what uh, makes me happiest when it comes to, like, my business, and I know that this is what I want to focus my energy on, and really just honing in on that, because it's easy to get, you know, for days to pass by where you just answered emails all day or edited photos, and you didn't have time to make content for Instagram or TikTok or, you know, anything else like that. So um, I think just staying true to, like, what is important to make your business grow the most and honing in on that and seeing how you can get help doing the other things um, has helped me a lot. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys.